Welcome to the emotions chapter. I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to talk about emotions today because emotions are hugely important to the ideas of social psychology. We love the psychology of emotions. They're great. This is part one. We'll talk more about ideas of misattribution, of arousal, and things like that next time. But let's start with this. What is an emotion? Now, we've kind of mentioned this before, but emotion is a temporary affect of experiencing of experience involving a physiological response. So when we talk about uh, ideas of emotion, normally we talk about affect, behavior, cognition, and affect is feeling states. An emotion then is a temporary affective experience. By temporary, I mean you're not gonna be affectively experiencing this like for days on end. And there's a specific physiological response involved, meaning when you feel angry, you can actually feel physically the response that's involved. It's temporary though, because you're not gonna literally be angry the whole time. You gotta go to bed at some point. So it's gotta be, it's, it's a temporary affective state. So an emotion is a temporary affective experience involving a physiological response. That's an emotion. Now, how is that different from other kinds of affect? Remember, affect is feeling states, so there's lots of different kinds of ways that you can have feelings in general. And so when we talk about things like moods, for example, a mood is an affective state, which is not exactly an emotion. It tends to be less intense and can be for longer periods of time. You can be in a bad mood for a longer period of time, an affective state, but it's not quite as intense as something like an emotion. All right. Tell me whether you like scary movies. Now, isn't that interesting to like scary movies? What is it about a scary movie that somebody would like or not like? Don't, how do we like fear? That uh, it, emotions are an integral part of being human. It's an integral part of being human. We like to experience emotions. We like to be able to experience those things. Now, part of this has to do with the idea of not having to actually be in it, right? To be able to be one step removed helps when we're discussing things like a scary movie. It's better to watch a movie about a mass murderer than to actually be hanging out with a mass murderer, that kind of an idea. But the experience of emotion is often seen as a way that people understand their current state, how everything is going, et cetera. But this can be really interesting because your emotions, turns out, are a little bit susceptible to uh, influence, shall we say? Let's keep going with this. Emotions are a very social experience, very social. Let's start with the basic idea of recognizing emotions in other people. So do you see participant one right there, person number one? This is person number one, okay? What emotion is person number one experiencing? Now, for most of you, it's not really difficult to figure out that person number one is experiencing anger, right? Not only that, you can kind of see what all of these different people are experiencing just by looking at a picture of their face. Anger, fear, disgust, surprise, happiness, sadness. These are what we call basic emotions. Now, we'll get to ideas of basic emotions in just a second, but just to make sure that we're totally clear on this, those, uh, do those emotions sound familiar? Like if you've seen a Pixar movie? Yeah, like the movie Inside Out. The reason why they use those is because they're based off of what we know as basic emotions. And to understand basic emotions, we have to tell you a story. This story has to do with a person named Charles Darwin. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before, but Charles Darwin had this theory called natural selection. The idea is that uh, evolution made it so that people passed on certain traits. Well, Charles Darwin actually has a paper about facial expressions with emotions. And what his idea is, is that your facial expressions are inborn traits. You inherit them. They're inborn. So for example, when you experience anger, it is an automatic, an instinct, an inborn trait for you to go, mm, right? To make that face, mm, trying to make that face. But the problem is, it's a little hard to prove whether or not the experience of emotion is inborn, that is, it, you, you get it through your genes, or whether you learn it from society around you and you're really just doing a social learning. How do you know whether somebody's experience with anger is an instinct or learned by growing up for years and years with people who went like this, 
when they're angry. Well, <clears throat> Charles Darwin didn't have the way to do that. So we fast forward to Paul Ekman. Paul Ekman is a researcher. Uh, we're looking in now in like in the 1960s and 70s that we're talking here. Paul Ekman was, uh, was involved in this idea of facial expressions. And he thought, hey, I think I can actually show scientifically whether or not these facial expressions are actually uh, passed on or whether they're learned through culture. So here's what he did. Number one, he had people actually make facial expressions. Now, so you see, you see these pictures right here. These pictures are actually some of Paul Ekman's pictures. And instead of saying, hey, show me what anger looks like, he would say, all right, now I want you to, to contract this muscle here and this muscle here and this muscle here and this muscle here. And he would say, hey, just contract these muscles until he got somebody to be in the facial expression that recognized, uh, that people would recognize his anger. The reason why that's important is because you can't, if you're trying to separate this from culture, you can't just say, go be angry, right? Because the culture tells you how to be angry. So in this case, he's trying to get the facial expression exactly right. And so what he does, is he takes these facial expressions, all these pictures of facial expressions, and there's more than six. There's more than six at the time. He takes them to Papua New Guinea, to a, an island that has a tribe of people with extremely limited, uh, one would say almost none, no experience with the outside world. They had a translator and that's about it, right? They go to this, this tribe who really has no interaction with Western culture, and they show them these pictures and they say, you know, what is person one experiencing? Just like I asked you. Or they would give them scenarios, things like, hey, tell me how you feel if uh, somebody comes and steals your food, that kind of thing, right? What they found when they showed all of these was that there were six emotions that people recognized, even though they had like no experience with Western culture. They were anger, fear, disgust, surprise, happiness, sadness, the six basic emotions. Basic emotions, anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, and surprise. Those are the ones that we recognize, right? Now, over time, they did this study several different times in different, uh, with different people, and they added one extra one, and that was contempt. They found that actually contempt was also recognized visually by people who uh, had no experience with Western culture. Now, the reason why this is such a big deal is because if you can recognize these basic emotions, that means that they had to have come through through genes. They had to be instinct. They couldn't be learned because these people had never interacted with Western culture. And so it could not have been based off of culture. Further studies have found that these same kinds of things can be found with people who have been blind since birth. Uh, or in some cases, even you can see it with, uh, with newborn infants. They'll make these faces even though they're too young to have learned any of these particular facial expressions. Okay, we need to talk uh, about how universal these are. These are so universal and recognizable that we recognize them even in cartoon characters, as well as, according to some theorists, in uh, non-human primates. The idea here is that by recognizing a facial expression, we're communicating with other people, uh, or maybe even some species, some other species, about how we're feeling and what is going on and what we're experiencing. Now, we're gonna kind of put that to the side for just a second. We're gonna play two truths and a lie. And in order to do this, uh, I want you to think about the basic emotions in just a few minutes, but first let's just play two truths and a lie. So here's how this goes. I'm going to tell you two things that are true about me and two things, uh, two, two, two things that are true and one thing that is a lie, all right? Two of these things are true, one of them is a lie. And then you have to decide which one is the lie, okay? Only one of these is a lie. What we're trying to figure out is whether or not you can tell when people are lying. So here we go, ready? Here's my two truths and a lie, and they're not in order necessarily. You gotta figure out which one is. Okay, number one, I have ridden my bicycle from Canada to Mexico. Number two, 
I have eaten monkey brains. Number three, I have jumped into Lake Michigan on New Year's Day. Which one is the lie? I've never eaten monkey brains. Monkey brains, gross. I wouldn't want to eat. That's gross. I've never eaten monkey brains. That sounds icky just to say. But I have ridden a bicycle from Canada to Mexico. And I have jumped into Lake Michigan on New Year's Day. I have done those things. Now, is it easy? How good are you at uh, telling when somebody is lying? Well, remember that guy named Paul Ekman that I mentioned before? The one who did the basic emotions? He has a theory regarding basic emotions and how they can lead to lie detection. So let's go ahead and watch this video and we'll talk about it. So in that video, you saw that Ekman, that was Paul Ekman, talking. And he is saying that if these basic emotions are really innate, they're instinctual, that means that when I feel anger, I have to make the face. I have to make that angry face. However, we as humans know that these facial expressions convey information about us. And if you are, let's say you're a salesperson and your customer makes you angry, you do not want to communicate that you're angry. You want to communicate that you're happy, right? And help them. So we as humans have learned to mask our facial expressions. That means we can actually, even though we're want to, we want to feel angry and go, mm -hmm, we can actually mask our expression to go, yeah. But Paul Ekman is saying, if these are truly basic emotions, that is they're instinctual and inborn, then at least for a split second, you have to have that angry expression. At least for a split second. Now, he is not saying that now that I've told you that, you can now tell whenever anybody's lying, but he does create, he has at least in the past, create uh, training programs where people can learn uh, to try and look for what he calls micro expressions. So these are very fast facial expressions based off of basic emotions. They're saying that, hey, if you're feeling contempt, then you have to, you have to give a, uh, a basic, you have to give that facial expression at least for a microsecond. And if we can tell that you're doing that and then masking how you really feel, that means that you are lying. Okay. So which one of these is not a basic emotion? So shame is not a basic emotion. Being ashamed of someone is not a basic emotion. Remember, basic emotions are inborn, they're natural. They happen without any learning at all. And what that means is that some other emotions that you experience like shame, but other ones as well, like guilt, embarrassment, pride. There's other ones besides these. These are not the only ones. But these are examples of what we would call moral or social emotions. Now, the reason why they're moral or social emotions is because you have to learn. You have to learn about these and you have to have a society in order to do this. Do you remember we talked about self-awareness and theory of mind? Self-awareness is the idea that I know that I'm an individual. Remember the mirror task. Theory of mind is I have a theory that you have a mind. I understand that people have their own point of view, their own mind, a mind of their own, and therefore can make judgments about me. Some emotions that we experience are social in their nature. That is, that we have to understand what other people are thinking about us and how they are judging us in order to experience that emotion. So for example, you really can't feel shame unless you understand that you could be judged by someone else, that they have an opinion about you, that they disapprove of what you're doing and therefore you would feel ashamed. They are not basic emotions. Basic emotions are innate, natural, inborn. They happen with out learning anything. But these moral or social emotions, those require understanding where you fit in society and how other people think of you. Therefore, they require self-awareness and theory of mind. So let's move on and talk about some of the classic theories about emotions. I want you to tell me when you are sad, you personally, when you are sad, what happens to your body? So I expect that when you're answering that, you're saying several things like 
Maybe you feel weighed down. Maybe you talk about your mouth going in this direction, like a frown. Maybe you talk about the fact that your body literally produces water out of your tear ducts and you literally cry. Sometimes you go like this, right? As well. The body is an important part of experiencing emotions. If you remember that the definition, the definition of an emotion is that there is a physiological response that is involved. So therefore your body plays an important part in an experience of an emotion. Now what this means is that sometimes you experience the emotion because of what your body is doing and not because of how the world is actually going. And we'll get to that when we talk in the next video, but let's talk about several theories uh, that are the classic emotion theories. So, William James and uh, his, uh, his colleague, I can't remember his first name, Lang, were some of the first psychologists, some of the first social psychologists. We're talking about like 1800s, like early 1900s, very long ago. And they were ones who were tackling this kind of an idea. They realized that what happens is that some, that your body is really tied to these emotions. And so what he's saying is that, hey, in, in their theory, James Lang's theory, they are saying, hey, you have physiological arousal. Now, remember, arousal doesn't have to mean sexual arousal. It means something happens that stimulates your body, right? So just having your heart beat faster is a form of arousal. So what James and Lang are saying is that what happens is your body changes first. And the way your body changes then is the experience of emotion that the body comes first. So what they're saying is that when you are saying that you feel sad, what's actually happening is your body is starting to frown, starting the tear ducts, and then you start going like this. Your body changes first and that creates the sadness. So in the James Lang theory, first the physiological arousal, then the emotion. Later on, Cannon and Bard modified that theory and said, hey, you know what? What's going on is the arousal and the emotional experience, they happen simultaneously. They happen at the same time. So you are starting to feel sad and immediately at the same time, your body is creating the tears and frowning and hyperventilating, that kind of stuff. Later on, Schachter and Singer, they went one step further and said, you know what? Actually what happens is at least sometimes you have an arousal, a physiological arousal, and then you think, hey, what's going on with this physiological arousal? You have a cognition that identifies that arousal as a form of emotion. So unlike the James Lang theory, Schachter and Singer have this cognition part in the middle. Now, we're not saying that you literally sit there and say, golly, I think that my, uh, I think that my tears, my uh, eyes are making tears. Therefore, I must be sad. That's not what they're saying. They're saying that you have this physiological arousal, maybe your heart's just beating faster. You look around sometimes in your environment, social environment, looking around and say, hey, my heart's beating fast. Why is my heart beating fast? Oh, it's because someone is yelling at me. Therefore, I must feel angry. All right. Of these, Schachter and Singer is probably the most famous, at least nowadays. In fact, the entire second part of this, uh, the second video is going to be all about Schachter and Singer. But to look at these, here's the way you think about these. All right, so let's say you see a car coming right at you, right? There's a car coming right at you. The James Lang theory says that first your heart starts beating fast. That's the arousal. Your heart's beating fast and that creates fear. So the car causes your heart to beat fast, and that is then causes the fear. Cannon Bard says these happen at the same time. You experience the fear while your heart's beating fast, they're happening at the same time. In the meantime, Schachter and Singer are saying that your heart starts beating faster, right? You're experiencing the arousal, and then you have a cognitive label, a cognitive interpretation. Hey, my heart's beating fast. Why is my heart beating fast? Oh, car's coming at me. I must be experiencing fear. All right, those are the difference between those. One question that I have for you, can you experience an emotion without any cognition at all? 
We're going to move on from those three basic ones. Can you experience an emotion without being able to put a label on something? Now, you know, remember, the cognition does not have to be active, right? It can be automatic, right? Automatic cognition, processing of information. But do you think you can experience an emotion without any cognition? This was a big debate between two major social psychologists, Zients and Lazarus. So Robert Zients is a very famous Z-A-J-O-N-C, that's, that spells science, rhymes with science, and Lazarus. And Zients felt that emotions do not require cognition. I mean, they can have cognitions at all, but for you to experience emotion, Zients would say, hey, you can experience the emotion independent of whatever's going on in your brain. Lazarus, on the other hand, says that emotions do require cognitive appraisal. Whenever you're experiencing some sort of emotion, you've got to be able to label it as fear or label it as danger or label something, not actively per se, but just even identifying your body's experience as sadness or whatever is a cognition. And therefore, you must be able to have cognition in order to experience the emotion. So there's an ongoing debate between those two. Uh, some people believe that affect is independent of, um, of your cognition, that your affective states is independent. But many people nowadays actually believe that affect and cognition are tied, right? That what we experience as feelings require processing of information, that your affect requires a certain amount of cognition, if nothing else, to give labels to something, but requires you to be able to interpret information, process it, and that is what is involved in our experience of emotions. All right, that's good enough. Thanks, everybody.